Let's turn now to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, and see that almost immediately we learn something amazing about the maturity and discernment and wisdom with which Paul deals with his people in the light of possible misunderstandings. I want us so much in this session to grasp how Paul is self-conscious about his words and how they may be heard. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Father, as we look at these initial words of Paul and his spontaneous rejoicing, and his concern that they hear him aright. Show us how to be wise, mature, spontaneous, thoughtful, discerning people in the way we communicate with others. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing to notice is that Paul is overflowing. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. He just overflows here with joy that is great, Because they had, after a season of not sending him anything, have revived, renewed their concern for him. And we know that this refers to their objective generosity in sending money to him or supplies to him through the hand of Epaphroditus because just just a few verses later in chapter 4 verse 18 he says I have received full payment and more I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent they're a fragrant offering they're a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God so he's still effusing over this these gifts that they have sent him so that's what's in mind when he says Oh, how I rejoiced greatly when Epaphroditus showed up with your bounty to me. So that's the first thing I want us to notice, that a mature, discerning, wise person spontaneously and authentically feels and expresses the joy of thankfulness to those who have done him a favor. Now, here's the thing that seems to grip Paul And I want us to learn from. Not only is Paul in his maturity and wisdom spontaneous and authentic and overflowing with real emotions of thankfulness and joy, but he's aware, even as he speaks, that he could be heard in a wrong way. And this is a mark of maturity. It doesn't stop you from overflowing with authentic truthfulness and emotion, but it does shape the way you talk. Now, here's what I have in mind. He says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at length you have revived your concern for me. And immediately he's aware that when he says, at length you have revived, they might take it as a criticism that he's really pointing out how they've neglected him for a while. And what does he do? Uh, Here's another possible misunderstanding. Would not some of his enemies say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know why he's so happy finally and greatly rejoicing is because Paul loves money. Paul is in this for the money. Now, those two misunderstandings are precisely what Paul addresses here, which is what we'll look at today. And then the second one here. This is his address to the first misunderstanding. Namely, I see he's really criticizing us for not for a long time giving him what he needs. He's a, it's a backhanded insult and criticism. And then this is the one that says, I'm not in it for the money. So let's take those one at a time. But in the process, I don't want you to miss this lesson. 
a mature person not only says what is authentically on his or her heart, a mature person discerns how he might be heard, right? And I would just pause here and say, how how do you become a mature, wise, discerning person so that you can spontaneously imagine how your words are being heard? Because Paul imagines one and two possible wrong ways his words could be heard here. That's what's going on in his mind. He's not just... uh, saying what he feels, he's saying what he feels in the awareness that what he's saying could be heard this way, and it could be heard this way, and he undertakes then, you could say, to parry, or that is to, uh, to, to answer in a, in a sensitive and discerning way the uh, misunderstandings. He wants to avoid the misunderstandings of his words. So he adds this, and then he adds this. How do you become a person who can discern that? And I'll just put down maybe three quick things. Now, these are not coming out of the text. They're coming out of my suggestion from my my life wisdom and my discernment of other things in the Bible, and I'm just commending them to you for you to consider. I think you become a person who who speaks and listens like this, who is aware, self-conscious like this, by being Bible-saturated. Second, by being attentive, maybe, to life experience. In other words, you're really watching how people communicate. You're watching facial expressions. You're watching body language. You're watching tone of voice. You are an attentive, aware, alive human being that is watching all the time in how life works in people's lives. And then third, you, you ponder how how life experience affects your words. What have you learned from life experience and from the Bible? Bible Bible-saturated attentiveness to life, pondering the implications of those experiences for your words. What does that do? Well, it produces this kind of discernment. So Paul now chooses to answer two possible misunderstandings of his language. Here's the first one. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So you can see what he's doing. If anybody says, Paul, you don't think we were concerned about you when we didn't send you anything? You are so insensitive. You are so undiscerning. Why would you jump to that conclusion, Paul? And he's saying, no, no, no. I didn't jump to that conclusion. I believe, I know you were concerned for me. And the reason that you didn't for a season send me anything is because you had no opportunity. Now, there's a, there's a principle behind that. And let me point you to it. Here it is in 2 Corinthians 8, 10 to 12, where Paul says, in this matter of preparing to give uh, to my collection for the poor in Jerusalem. So he's trying to motivate the Corinthians to give when he comes and makes a collection. And here's the principle he wants them to follow. I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work of collecting money for the poor, but to desire it. Your desires were in accord with your doing and your doing with your desiring. You were internally and externally doing the right thing. So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it. In other words, he admits there's a readiness inside And it would be fitting for that readiness to be expressed in their actual giving. And then here's the principle. 
For if the readiness is there, if your heart's eagerness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So if you don't have money, God recognizes the eagerness to give as giving. If you don't have opportunity to give, God recognizes the readiness to give as really giving. And so behind this sentence in Philippians 4.10 is that principle. You were indeed concerned for me. There was all kinds of love and and compassion and readiness in your heart for me, but there was no Epaphroditus to carry your money all that long way, but now Epaphroditus has risen to the occasion, and you have come, and in this I rejoice. So you can see what he's doing. He spontaneously overflows with great joy. He says the truth. It has been a while since you gave, but I don't recognize that as a delinquency in your heart, but as an occasion of lack of opportunity. And I'm rejoicing that God in his providence has kept it in your heart and now put it in the heart of Epaphroditus to put uh, wheels on your great generosity. Next time, he answers the second possible misunderstanding of his words, namely, Paul, you're just in it for the money.